So this is a section called Lessons Learned. And I'm going to tell you some of the things I learned while taking Hyperwall from an academic research project to being a global multi-million dollar business. And these are lessons that you should perhaps be able to apply in your commercial ventures, but also most of them apply to life in general. Uh, the earlier you learn some of the lessons, perhaps the better you can avoid the problems I encountered and go ahead and encounter your own new and novel problems. All right, first one. How often do you say to yourself, or you say to somebody else, I have to do something, I need to do something, I've got to do something? Show of hands. These are not rhetorical questions. So what's the next thing, and I'm, we're going to actually ask, ask people to, to shout out, what's the next thing you have to do, need to do, or got to do, that you don't want to do? Study. Study. OK. And what if I told you you don't have to study? I mean, I'd fill my classes. You fill, there's a consequence. But you do have a choice, don't you? Anybody else have something they have to do but don't really want to do? Yeah. Wash the dishes. Wash the dishes. And what happens if you don't do that? I'm just not going to eat for some time. You're not going to eat. You'll get you know green, fuzzy things growing on the plates, right? You have a choice. Wash them or not. Some people will just throw them out. Anybody else? Research. Research. You have to do research. And if you don't, what happens? I don't graduate. You don't graduate. That's right. So I'm going to tell you a story how I learned this lesson. I mentioned earlier I have three daughters. Um, and the oldest one was in her sophomore year of high school at Woodbridge High School, just a couple miles from here. And I don't know if any of you know, but Woodbridge has a nationally famous music program. In fact, two years ago, they actually won a Grammy for one of the best high school music programs in the country. Their marching band, which is perennially one of the tops in the state, was invited to compete at the first annual national marching band <coughs> competition at the White House. This was uh, four or five, six, seven years ago, when Hyperwall was in its very early days, maybe two, three years old. And I had an opportunity to be a chaperone and go on that trip. But I said to myself, I have to stay home. I need to take care of Hyperwall. I've got to grow the business. So I can't go on the trip. Well, my daughter went with the band to Washington. And I missed her first trip to our nation's capital. I missed seeing her perform in competition at the White House. And they won. And I missed seeing my daughter earn the title of national champion. You don't have to go through that more than once, unless you're really stupid, and learn a lesson. Have to, need to, and got to shouldn't rule your life. Instead, change it. Anytime you're going to say in your head, I have to do something, I need to do something, or I've got to do something, change it to, I choose to do something. I choose to wash the dishes. I choose to do my research. I choose to study. And when you say it that way, it either makes sense or it doesn't. If I said, I have to stay home and miss my daughter's performance, OK. But if I said to myself, I choose to stay home and miss my daughter's performance. It doesn't make sense. So change it to that. Change it to I choose to in your head. See if it makes sense. And if it does, do it. And if it doesn't, don't do it. Be aware, as we just discussed here, there's always consequences. But take those consequences into consideration and make a decision. The point here is that you and only you are in control of your lives. And you've got to figure out what really is most important, not just for your career, not just for your education, but for your life. And all of that needs to be done in balance. First lesson. <clears throat> know your core competency. Anybody want to tell me what their core competency is? The thing they're good at, the thing they want to do? 
All right, I'll tell you mine. My core competency is being able to take an idea and figure out how to make a business out of it, develop a strategy, execute it, and actually make a business. I actually have two degrees in computer science, a bachelor's from Rutgers, a master's from UC Irvine. I'm not a practicing engineer anymore. I haven't been a practicing engineer for a couple of decades. The knowledge serves me well, but that's not who I am or what I do anymore. I know my core competency. And the point is not just to know your core competency, um, but to stick to it. So if I have come up with an idea for a software product, I'm not going to go try and program it myself because that's not my area of expertise, even though I do have two degrees in computer science. My area of expertise is business strategy, business growth, and, and doing the vision thing. Each of you should try and figure out what is your core competency. What is the thing that, that drives you? What is the thing you're good at? Do that. And when there are other things that need to be done for which you are not particularly well suited, try and find somebody to help you. This is one of the secrets to Hyperwall. Um, as I mentioned, we have dozens of dealers around the world. We have strategic partners, and those all give us a global marketing and sales presence. But Hyperwall's core competency is developing the software. And rather than invest in building a huge sales force, we decided to use other people's sales forces because that's not our core competency. We don't want to be a sales and marketing company. We want to be a technology company. <coughs> And so we don't invest <coughs> in building a, a sales and marketing competency. Instead, we leverage the resources of others. So we build partners. We, we develop partnerships with companies that have salespeople literally around the world. We have actually sold, uh, last time I checked, five hyperwall systems into Kazakhstan. Who knows where Kazakhstan is? Anybody ever been there? Where's Kazakhstan? It's uh, Eastern Europe. Eastern, it's actually east of Eastern Europe. Yeah. It's, it's actually above China, even. Um, nobody would think that Hyperwall would sell there. But what happened is we found a dealer in Kazakhstan who was very well connected into the um, Kazakhstan government and who really understood Hyperwall. And he went in there, and he represented Hyperwall. He pitched Hyperwall. He demonstrated Hyperwall. He sold it. He installed it. He supported it. We, nobody from Hyperwall has ever been to Kazakhstan. And yet we have a thriving business there because we established a partner who has a presence there. So when there's something that's not your core competency, instead of trying to learn to do it yourself, Find somebody with whom you can form a partnership <coughs> and use their resources. And you know what? It may cost you a little bit of money. When we sell through a deal, let's sell, say our product is going to cost $1,000. If we sell it direct, we get all $1,000. If we sell it through a dealer, well, maybe we get $700 and the dealer gets $300. But that's OK. We're happy to give up that $300 because the $700 is money we would have never had without him because we didn't know a thing about Kazakhstan. We can't speak the language, we don't know any of the people, and we're not there. So leverage the resources of others. Blame yourself. Anybody want to tell me an example of when they should have blamed themselves? No, of course not, because you guys are all so shy, aren't you? Who wants to be an entrepreneur? No, no, seriously. Who wants to be an entrepreneur? OK. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you can't sit quietly in the background. You have to stand out from the crowd. Who's going to give me an example of how they should blame themselves? All right, I'll go first, and then let you kick in. Years ago, I was a product manager in the very early days of laser printers. I was working for Toshiba. And we came out with this brand new, really high-end laser printer. And we started shipping it. 45% of the units we shipped out to the field came back labeled dead on arrival. 45%. That's a horrendous failure rate. 
So these, these were being made in Japan, shipped to our warehouse over on Alton, and then we shipped them um, to all the local customers. So we started doing a 100% <coughs> inspection. Every laser printer that arrived in our warehouse, we unpacked it, set it up, and tested it. And you know what? There was a 2% failure rate. So we did some more investigating. Back in these days, a laser printer was a pretty complex thing to set up for first use. You had to install the charging wires, the coronas, the toner, the developers, the fusers. There were about seven or eight different things you had to put in the printer. And if you didn't do it just right, it failed. And it turned out people were damaging the printers because they weren't installing these consumables properly. So we said, but it's all documented. They're idiots. They just they can't do it. Well, if we say the problem is they're idiots, we can't fix that problem. So instead of saying they're idiots, we had to turn around and blame ourselves and say, you know what? We didn't explain the installation process in simple enough terms. So we took the original user's manual, we threw it out, we hired a specialist to create a new user's manual that was almost like a comic book with nice little cartoons, lots of white space, got rid of all the technical jargon and explained things in simple terms. We then started shipping the laser printer with the new user manual and the DOA rate in the field dropped from 45% to under 10%. We solved the problem by blaming ourselves because you can't change what other people do you can influence what other people do, but you can't change it. You can change what you do. We changed the user's manual. We spoke to the customers on a level they could understand and solve the problem. All right, who's going to tell me something for which they can blame themselves? Come on, if you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, in the back. Um, at a, my internship, um, I was working on an application that was given to another developer, but for some reason, he got put to a different project. So when I started working on the application, I just started getting all these crashes and bug, or bug reports or bug errors. And I could, I mean, like, I easily, my first instinct was like, well, that's not my fault, you know, I didn't build this, you know. And I could just go up to my supervisor and be like, hey, you know, I need to go talk to the person. But for some reason, I just couldn't. They're on a different project. So I just stuck it up and, you know what, I got to fix this. So I could easily just blame, hey, you know, it's not my problem. Why should I be stuck with this whole? Right. But if you, if you blame somebody who's no longer available, you can't solve the problem of making it work, right? You've got to own it and just do what it takes. Good. All right. By the way, you can be an entrepreneur now. The rest of you guys, you're just going to be corporate minions, uh, unless unless you step step up and uh, and and become involved. No excuses. It's a similar similar thing. When there's something that has to be done, it has to be done. And if it doesn't get done, it could hold up a project, it could slow down a company, it could disrupt your personal life. Whatever it is, if there's something that really needs to be done, and this goes back to, is it a have to, a need to, a, a, a gotta, or is it a I choose to? But if it's something that you really choose to do, there can't be excuses. You can't say it's too hard, you can't say I don't know. Find somebody who can help. Drop another activity. My, my daughter, um, who is uh, the same one who went to Washington without me, uh, always tells me about, well, uh, her car. Her car had a, um, a, a recall on it six months ago. She hasn't taken care of it. And we had a spare car. So she could have used the spare car. Now the spare car is gone. And uh, she kept telling me excuses about, well, I'm too busy to do it this week. I'm too busy to do it that week. Now she doesn't have a spare car, so she's going to have to take her car in her shop and take the bus for a week. That's not something she wants. Uh, but when there's something that needs to be done, if it really needs to be done, be aware there's going to be consequences. And when you're in a small company, especially a, a startup, if you say, well, I don't know how to do this, or I can't do this, or I don't have enough time, it can make the entire company grind to a halt. So no excuses. Figure out what it takes. Go get help, go get resources, spend money if you've got to. As, a, as an entrepreneur, that's something you generally don't want to do, but find a way to get it done, or find a way to make it unnecessary. But you can't just ignore it. You can't just say you can't. Who thinks entrepreneurs are risk takers? 
You're in the front. Tell me why. Um, <clears throat> most of the time, because you have to disrupt. Um, literally, like you have to be, you have to be different. You can't just be the same thing, or else people won't. Okay. You have to be different. You can't be the same thing. Yeah. That's all true. But is that risky? Sometimes, because you don't know if you're the way you're different will work, like your approach. Okay. Sometimes, because you don't know if you're different or, or in a or, good or, way. Or Anybody bad. else? Want to say why entrepreneurship is risky? So, um, a lot of times you don't know if your venture is going to be successful. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I have read the idea that it's it may be even more riskier over the course of a long term life plan to not take these risks. It may be riskier over a lifetime to not take the risks of entrepreneurship. So, uh, yes, I agree. Anybody else? Come on, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to raise your hand at some point. Lack of steady income. Lack of steady income, perhaps, yes? Investing your time and money. Investing your time and money. So, lack of steady income, maybe, although a lot of entrepreneurs start their entrepreneurial venture moonlighting while they still have a job to maintain income. And then, is it wasted time? Well, you're still putting in enough time to maintain the income during the day, so you can pay the bills or whatever, or you know, move back with mom and dad. It's happened to me already, I know. Um, and then you don't have some expenses, and perhaps you can go off and start your own venture. My belief is that entrepreneurs are not risk takers. Entrepreneurs are risk managers. I believe I am actually taking less risk being an entrepreneur because when I'm in a company working for a McDonnell Douglas or a Toshiba or a Canon, my future is out of my control. There's some bureaucrat five levels above me who's making the decisions that are going to affect whether I have a job or not. I've been laid off, I don't know, three, four times in my life. I was fired once. Um, Interestingly enough, the guy who fired me got fired the next day for firing me, and I got rehired. So that was fun. Um, as an entrepreneur, I manage my risk. You said you don't know if your product's going to be successful. Then find out. Don't invest lots and lots of money in developing a product until you know what the market wants. All right? Uh, in, in a marketing program or in a business strategy program, you're always taught to be market driven. Don't create a product because you, the engineer, think it's cool. Create the product because you've actually talked to potential customers and they've said, yeah, that's something I think I would spend money on. And if you do those kinds of things, you can mitigate the risk, you manage the risk, and I believe what I'm doing actually is less risky than my colleagues who are going off putting their fates in the hands of corporate managers who don't even know who they are as individuals. They're just numbers on an org chart. So think of it as you will, but I believe entrepreneurs are actually avoiding risk and managing it if they're doing a good job. It's not what you know, it's who you know. So I mentioned how I started Hyperwall was because I decided to network. I contacted the university <coughs> offering to help, and I had no expectations of any kind of financial um, results for me. I just decided Look, UCI is five miles down the road. I should be engaged. I'm going to volunteer to help however they want. And I expanded my network. And the more people you know, the more opportunities will present themselves to you. There is a saying, make sure I get it right, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You make your own luck by being prepared. Build a network. That way you can find out about things, people can find out about you, and you never know when some kind of spontaneous little reaction is going to occur where you happen to meet the right person or hear the right idea that triggers the start of a business. Just like I didn't know when I volunteered to help the um, ICS Alumni Association with fundraising and membership drives that it was going to lead to me discovering Hyperwall, meeting the inventors of technology, and using that to grow a global multi-million dollar business. So always, always network.
Uh, I actually have set, set an objective for me that at least twice a month, I want to sit down and have a one hour, one on one discussion with somebody whom I've never met. And you'd never know what's going to come out of that. Almost always it's going to be an interesting uh, meeting and there may be opportunities for you to help them. There may be opportunities for them to help you. You'll never know if you don't cast your net out and do some networking. Process enables delegation. When you get into a big company, any, anybody ever work for a big company? No, everybody's pure organic. Yes, what company did you work for? Experian. Experian. When you started at Experian, did they give you a company policies and procedures manual or something like that? Yeah. yeah. How big was it? I didn't read it. You did? Ah, okay, <laughs> you didn't read it. All right, good, exactly. It was what, maybe a two inch binder or something, right? So all these companies have policies and procedures and entrepreneurs especially detest those things because they're bureaucratic red tape policies and procedures that you never want to be bothered with. But here's the secret. If you want to be the CEO or actually anybody in, in, in um, senior level of a startup company, one of the secrets to success in a startup is the CEO and, and the rest of senior management need to look out at the world, need to look inside at the company, and need to figure out what needs to be done. And then they need to figure out how to do it. And then they need to do it a few times because their guess as to what needs to be done and how it needs to be done is probably a little bit wrong. <coughs> so you do it a few times. And you do it again and again and again. With Hyperwall, I sold every one of the Hyperwall systems for the first three years until I figured out how to sell it and who to sell it to. And then we hired a salesperson. And I then had to train that person how to sell the product. And I needed to present him with the process for selling Hyperwall. How to identify customers, how to communicate to them, how to convince them to buy. And when I've done that, and he's able to take it on, then I can delegate sales to him and focus my efforts on what's the next problem to solve. First, what is the problem, how to solve it, and then improving it. You can't delegate something to somebody else if you haven't defined the process, because if you don't define the process, they don't know what you want them to do. And if they don't know what you want them to do, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to get it done. Now, does that mean you need to have a two-inch experience style process and procedures manual. No. You create a little online wiki and you just drop a, a two sentence or three paragraph entry in there that says this is how to sell a hyper wall. And it can be a living document. It expands over time. But the point is as you learn to do something, document it so other people can do it and then you can move on to other, challenge, uh, other, other challenges. Don't get um, hung up on on just expecting other people to be able to do it. You've developed valuable knowledge in your initial attempts and your initial failures and help them benefit from that. Market driven, now we talked about this already. I'm gonna tell a story though about market driven. About 20 years ago, my wife, the social ecology major and myself, bought a new house in Irvine and we needed to buy a new phone for the kitchen. Our own old phone was actually a corded phone. Most people here probably never even used a corded phone. But uh, we had a corded phone, it got broken when we were moving, so we had to buy a new phone. And I said, well, since we have two phone numbers, one for <coughs> the family, one for my home office, it's got to be a two-line a two phone. And it needs to be cordless. It should support multiple handsets. It's got to be the new 2.7 gigahertz technology. It's got to have headset jacks. Bluetooth hadn't been even conceived of yet. Um, and I listed all these technical capabilities that I wanted in this phone. My wife said, if it's going in my kitchen, it has to be white. At the time, there was only one company making white cordless phones. It was Uniden. And by the way, none of their white cordless phones had any of the technical features I wanted. But guess which company won the business? Uniden. Because they understood the market. 
that the packaging was just as important as the technology. They won the deal. So go out, talk to your customers or your potential customers, find out what's important to them, and what you may learn is that there are things that are important to them that are not what you had anticipated. Build that into your product, and you can win business like Uniden won our phone business, phone contract. No, not contract, purchase. Prioritize. Prioritize and prioritize. At the end of the day, or the end of the week, how often do you say to yourself, Oh darn, I didn't get something done. Anybody ever do that? And it's usually something that was pretty important. And if you go back over that day or over that week, think about all the things you did that were less important that somehow got done. And the reason that that happens is twofold. Number one, very often we confuse urgency with importance. Just because something is urgent doesn't mean it's important. So maybe you respond to something urgent, maybe you let it sit for a little while. Maybe you don't actually have to pick up your cell phone and check your email right now. Hint, hint. Yeah, you. Uh -huh. ah, ah, you're caught. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, maybe you don't have to take that phone call. There's lots of things you may not have to do. It's a, only you can make your priorities, and I actually think it's very valuable to use it, and there's lots and lots of apps you can use this for. Put an app on your phone and list, list the things you have to get done today, this week, this month, and make sure those are the things you work on. And if you do that, you're going to reduce the frequency by which at the end of the day, the week of the month, you're saying, oh damn, I didn't get something done that I needed to do. You've got to set your priorities and make sure you're adhering to those priorities. That's it. Learn from those lessons. Hopefully you can, as I said, avoid some of the mistakes I made and go out and make your own mistakes. And then tell the next generation how to avoid your mistakes. Of course, by then they'll have forgotten my mistakes and they'll repeat those. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, I'll stick around if anybody has questions. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.